Hi everybody, welcome to my November 1st, 2019 episode number 31 uh, broadcast of my vlog and I am moving slowly towards figuring out how podcasting works so eventually, hopefully this month in the next 30 30 days in November, hopefully in the next 30, uh, 30 days I will figure out how to do podcasting I'm going to start saving up to uh, be able to get some equipment uh, I need to get a microphone and a boom uh, swivel boom I guess and a bunch of other things so eventually I'm going to do that and we may not be doing as I may not be doing as many live uh, broadcasts but I'm going to uh, still try to kind of keep everything all figured out as I slowly work towards it and we have uh, uh, some in my notes today I'm just going to go over a brief little bit on it and I'm going to try to keep this thing to under 30 minutes and I'm going to just try to keep that format from uh, now uh, onward Okay, so uh, the big one today, actually, I just came back from a session with a really cool family, um, and they have more than one dog. So this topic today is going to be about having more than one dog in your family, and how do we deal with it, how do you address it. And I've talked about this before, but I'm going to just kind of go over it a little bit. And so some of the points that we have is, hello, everyone, hello, everyone, happy Friday, happy Halloween. I uh, hope everything was good for all your doggies. Um, I posted up about how to deal with fireworks when the fireworks are going off and just essentially talking our dog uh, into understanding through the tone of my voice, through your voice, of how to understand your dog is having anxiety, to figure out which of the five or six dogs are having anxiety, which may react, causing the other dogs to bark. And that's what I do in that fireworks video. And I uh, hope everybody didn't have too much stress with their dogs, and hopefully no one's dogs ran away uh, and got scared by the fireworks. Hi, Sue. How are you? I hope your husband is uh, is uh, is doing well. I hope Momo and all your doggies and cats are doing well. Hope they like the dog food as well. Yeah, I kept them safe. Yay! Uh, Sue, um, okay. So, um, so uh, when it comes to having more than one dog, so it means to evaluate each dog individually and collectively. And then it's about maintaining the seniority of, uh, of arrival in the home, conversational tone, acknowledge all the dogs, say their names, touch them, equal amount of affection. And tomorrow's topic I am uh, very likely going to talk about uh, is if your dog is attacked by another dog at the off-leash park or uh, an off-leash area or just an area where they're running free, if that happens, what to do about maintaining eye contact with your dog, noticing the other dog, loudly announce your concerns to the other owners in the park or area, stepping in before necessary, after the fight, and after care uh, as well when it comes to that. So that'd be probably a topic I'll be talking about tomorrow. So I'm gonna do one topic at a time. I'm gonna end up doing a lot of the same thing, talking over and over again, just kind of reinforcing it and, and myself in the sense that you have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, I'm just going to turn that down. Um, so you have a better understanding of how to address your dog and to, to do that. Uh, I have over 1,400 days, over 20,000 hours working alone by myself inside my home uh, that I rent um, of working with dogs that are extremely dangerous, predatorial, giant dogs, 150, 160, 180 plus pound dogs that have significant bite histories and I work alone with these guys inside my home by myself without treats or medication with no muzzle uh, unless it's absolutely necessary uh, usually it isn't and then just working on regards to how to notice the nuances of dogs and uh, through this extensive experience is something that I've been able to successfully down train 100% of the dogs I've worked with across the board doesn't matter if they're skittish extremely skittish uh, OCD uh, dysfunctions of whichever you can think of aggression reactivity consequential behavior dependency issues o um, you know OCD as I said other aspects and traits um, uh, Kevin I guess is your dog Mary uh, oh and thank you Sue your advice was great thank you they love it okay they love the food and my advice is working great yeah you know that's why I say it's it's very possible to address behavior by evaluating the pictures of the dog and reading the description. Um, you know, psychiatrists do it, uh, therapists do it, counselors do it over the phone, they do it by video consult with people all the time as well. So there's no difference from what we do, uh, what I do when I work with a dog. Uh, the, the behavior is, is, is very natural and it's something that we want to 
be able to address with our dogs in real time. And we can do that over the phone, over video, by just talking and saying, okay, what's the issue? It's the same thing. And then having the uh, human being uh, have another person, for example, to hold the, their video camera or the phone while they're doing a live uh, corrections with their dogs. And you can ask anybody that I've worked with. It's pretty straightforward. Your advice about placing them on their leashes was great. Momo was really happy to greet all the children that came to the door. I didn't have to worry about her taking off. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because Momo was um, not happy and Momo doesn't like being picked up. And Momo likes to establish uh, presence in the home. So that's awesome. I'm glad, you know, like I say, when people say you can't train or address a dog without ever having met the dog, I say poppycock, I say that's silly, I say that's incorrect, I say that that's inexperienced speaking in that part. If you know what you're talking about, you're going to know about the topic. You're going to know what to say when someone asks you. So that's essentially it. So I want to kind of get into that part where everything that I do is unique and I have a rare gift with what I do with dogs, but I am able to teach that to people by putting that into human terminology and like with Sue uh, and with other people, and putting that into human terminology where we then have an understanding viscerally, uh, intelligently, uh, cognitively, just to understand what is going on with our dog and have that communication. So, um, okay, so I'm going to go back to the single post uh, item today is regards to having more than one dog. And that means evaluating each dog individually and collectively. And so, as I've spoken before in previous vlogs, it's about managing your dogs as if you were managing your children, as if you were managing a uh, an office full of different personalities. And and people who have worked with other other people who've managed, who've contracted as a you know lead contractor, and then you have all the subcontractors to manage. You you learn how to manage each person. You learn how to manage like maybe this guy, you know, he 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 likes his tools be left alone, no one else can touch it. And you have somebody else who is like, yeah, yeah, you can borrow my tools, and you have to adjust that type of personality, um, yeah, without the with throughout the whole group because one person is going to be like, I don't want to share my tools, and then the other person is saying, yeah, I'm sharing my tools with other people because I trust them, and then that becomes a whole dynamic within that you know your team, and you have to address it with your team by saying, okay, your personality of not trusting people versus this other person's personality of trusting people. It's okay for both of you to have different personalities. And then you want to be able to manage conflict by third parties, uh, other co-workers, other staff who are going to somehow maybe make certain comments to one party, the one who doesn't trust everybody, etc. You want to just say to that person, hey, stop it. It's the same thing with our dogs. So when we have dogs, you know, I usually have um, anywhere from three to six dogs in in my home. And as the people who know me, every single dog is is not nice. Every single dog has a bite history. They have an attack history. They have significant resource guarding. I'm going to turn that off. They have significant resource guarding. They have a lot of issues that are always going on with them. And they are antisocial or they are independently social in the sense that they don't have the influences from outside of their own secluded life or that they have been somewhat, you know, um, uh, kenneled or put in a different room or in a hoarding situation, all these parts of it. Um, and we want to be able to take all the dogs that come into, you know, I want to take all the dogs that come into to my home uh, to be able to integrate them. So one of the things I always do is making sure that I maintain seniority of arrival. And people may not think that that's probable, but it is. The dog understands, our dogs, every dog understands if they were before some other dog that showed up. Because how do they know? Because they were living in the house to begin with. And, you're, and the dog's like, la, 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 la. Wait, who's this new dog? Right? So Zevia would be happy with a new dog coming into the home sometimes. Right? It, it, it depends on what the other dog is like. So for Zevia to accept a dog coming into the home means it's a it's a matter of... Um, oh, okay, I'm just... Uh, sorry, it's a good nose here. It, it means it's a matter of managing how Zevia interprets the new dog coming in. Will Zevia establish the point of wanting to attack the other dog and if she does attack the other dog why is she attacking the other dog is it because the dog has stepped in into her territory as regards to her personal space the area around Zevia herself that she feels most comfortable with or has the other dog um, start playing with things or become too uh, 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 errant in behavior uh, rambunctious 
and is Zevia getting irritated by that? It's a personality trait aspect. And when we start, when I start looking at the dogs on a personality, individual personality, I pick up on their life. So then I understand Zevia doesn't like this and this with certain dogs, but she'll be okay. And it's the same thing with people with reactive dogs. You're walking down the street with your dog on leash. You see another dog coming. That's a dog reactive situation with your dog. You automatically start getting ready. You start getting ready, right? The same thing when it comes to inside the home is we want to anticipate Zevia's personality versus the new dog, say for example, the new dog's name is um, Johnson. So then we want to make sure that Johnson is going to be uh, uh, um, uh, kept under supervision, under my supervision, which then allows Zevia to trust that I'm maintaining Jonathan uh, Johnson's, uh, Johnson's behavior as well. So that part happens and then when I have a third dog and a fourth dog and a fifth and sixth and sometimes I've had seven dogs, you know, f uh, five great Danes here at once. Um, when I've had that happen, then it's a matter of understanding who came in seniority, Zevia, then Johnson, then, you know, the other da -da 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 other dogs. Um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of I'm thinking maybe I should make up the other names, but I won't even remember that because I'm making up the names now. Um, but yeah, if it's Zevia is here, then it's Johnson. Then whenever I do any aspect of referral to any of the dogs, it's always Zevia's name and she gets to move first. And then it's going to be Johnson. He gets to move second and then down the chain of seniority. And that seniority is not by age. It's by the arrival into the home. The same thing as if you are a um, uh, like in a family, like I said before, there's eight kids in the family. I'm number six in the family. That means the five above me get first right of refusal from whatever it is that my parents would give us and then I'm number six that means seven and eight in my family the two my younger brother and sister they get what I don't want and that's what will happen when it comes to our dogs and we know that our dogs know that it's the pecking order it's a sibling ship a rivalry whatever it is but it's something that happens so that means you have to pay attention to your dogs if you make it clear seniority wise Sevia. Johnson, three, number four, number five, number six, number seven, then they understand where you are in the point. And you're also able to address the dogs in regards to the behavior because you and your head have situated and developed an actual structure of who is in the position of your family. That way, if you see there's a problem, like if Zevia's cool and Johnson's cool, but say uh, uh, number three dog's name is Richard, if Richard's not cool, then we start addressing Richard's behavior because then Zevia and Johnson are expecting it out of their own familiarity with having lived with me for the length of time. I hope this makes sense. It makes sense in the part for me as well, is that there's Zevia. Zevia is used to my way of, of, of supervision, of parenting. Uh, Johnson's aware of my way of parenting, so forth like that. And then it's Richard, and Richard being the newer dog may not be familiar with my way of par parenting. So then Zevia and Johnson are like, okay, well, just let dad take care of this as he, as I go to discipline Richard for whatever behavior. If he's scratching, peeing, etc., then you know, Zevia and Johnson say, okay, that's cool. And then if there's other dogs below Richard, say, for example, the next dog's name is, uh, is Robert, then Robert will see that Richard is being addressed, and Robert will also obviously learn, but also Robert will go, okay, that's cool, that's not me. Right, and Zevia will be like, that's not me, and Johnson's that's not me. Um, so it's going to be uh, Richard that gets in trouble. Um, okay, so when you are talking to your dogs, always use conversational tone, and that is an emphasis that is extremely important because your dog understands you talking to them. Your dog completely understands the tone of voice that you're using. When you're talking to each other, if you're in a family, if you're you're married, you're living with somebody, you have children, whatever your dog hears you talking to the rest of your family your dog hears you going hey honey could you go grab that oh yeah we're gonna have dinner it's gonna be ready oh yeah I was just talking on the phone this is what we need for groceries etc and then you go turn to your dog hi Rosivia oh you're such a good girl just keep waiting dinner's coming honey you wouldn't talk like that to an adult human being you're talking to your dog in this disingenuous tone of voice your dog understands right off the bat I'm not in part of this family I'm getting talked down to I've said before it's like going up to if you talk to a three-year-old child and you talk babyish to a three-year-old child they'll say to you stop talking to me like I'm a baby 
they understand that. Your dog understands that. When you use conversational tone with your dog, your dog then realizes that you're talking to them just like part of the family, like people. They then become emotionally franchised. They become connected to us because we're treating them respectfully with the same tone of language. It, <coughs> excuse me. Which is no different than if you went to, uh, you know, like I said, to, to a restaurant and the waiter, waiter goes, Hi, today's specials are so-and-so. And you're just like, ah, I, I can't, I don't want to... You want the respect of conversation that goes on. Talk to your dog in a regular conversation. A lot of people say, well, I'm not used to talking to my dog like he's a living being. Well, then why do you have a dog? Your dog understands you talking to them. So use conversational tone. Use seniority with them. Acknowledge all your dogs as well. And what I mean by that is, say, for example, you're just sitting here on the computer. Randomly, out of the blue, just go and say, hi, Zevia. Hi, Johnson. Hi, Robert or Richard. What? I, see, that's what happened there. Uh, then, you, you know what I mean? You, and announce their names in, in order and make eye contact with them, too. So when I say Zevia, I'm going to look for Zevia. Hi, Zevia. When I look for Johnson, hi, Johnson. I'm going to maintain I'm going to maintain the eye contact 100% because that's what dogs work with, right? The eye contact, physical, body nuances, etc., Maintain that eye contact with your dog when you're saying their name and say every single dog in your home in order of seniority, which is in order of their arrival in your home. Even if it's a foster dog, they're all in that pecking order. It allows them to understand they have a position in your family. They allow themselves to rest easier knowing that they belong and that they're referenced in order. They know where they showed up. They know they're before the newer dogs. Absolutely 100%. It's an aspect of respect. You want to say their name clearly. You don't want to say, Hi, Sylvia. Sylvia. You want to make it a landed word. You want it as if you're saying to someone that you love them. You're going to say, Sylvia, Johnson, Richard, Robert. You want to make the acknowledgement for your dog. They hear their names spoken in respectful tones that individualize the dog as a being as a sentient part because they hear you saying it to you you know if your partner is you know hi susan it, it, the, your dog understands all that so again say their names right and if you do have the chance to do so touch your dogs at the same time if you feel like that if you have the ability the free time you know again like i said i have upwards of seven dogs um so it takes you know seven dogs ends up spending 10 minutes sometimes but um, what you would do is you would go up to, uh, I, for example, so I'll go up to, I'll, instead of saying Zevia's name one time, I'll say, I'll walk up to Zevia and I'll literally put my hand on her. I don't, I, I'll put my hand rested on her. I won't shake it. I just hold my hand still. I won't move it at all. Just hold my hand still. Hi, Zevia. I won't do anything and your dog will look at you and she'll look at me like, what are you doing? What, why are, you, what, are we going somewhere? What are we doing? What, what's going on? And then I just take my hand off and I walk over to the next dog and I say, and I put my hand on, hi, Johnson. I say it clearly so that the dog understands and hears their name said the same way every single time. Then I take it off. Then I go to the next dog. Hi, Richard. Next dog. Robert, it reinforces that feeling for your dog that they're included, that you went up to check on in on them. How many times have you been sitting at your table, or your desk, your computer, and your dog walks up to you and just noses you a little bit and then walks away, sniffs you and walks away? It's, an, it's their desire to engage. It's a dependency issue that the dog has as well. It can also be a check-in. It depends on the personality of the dog, right? That's why I say I'm able to have 100% accuracy reading dogs because I see every single dog individually. And individual means that they have their own nuance, dysfunctions, personality traits, etc. Just like me, I have a certain personality trait, you know, that may not work for 99% of the people, but 1% is all I need anyways. But, you know, it's just that uniqueness that we have. And when you do touch them, like I say, put your hand on them. Don't move your hand too much. Keep it still and then take it off and that's it. You can linger it off a bit as you pull your hand away. Absolutely, that's cool. But don't bring it back. Don't put your hand here and feel nervous and start shaking and scratching them. It's not a, an act 
of affection that you're giving them when you do that, then you start to engage them too much. You want to somewhat passively just touch your dog, keep your hand on your dog, hi Zevia, and then you just walk away. So anywhere from 7 to 12 seconds. 7 seconds is usually pretty good. And then you'll see that once you start having that connection, you're saying your dog's names, all of them, you're touching them on a regular basis, you have more of a connection. There's nothing more magical than having the person that loves you come up and hold your hand for no reason. Right? It's true love. It's things that I look for, everyone looks for. It's the most magical, amazing feeling. And your dog being an overt codependent is seeking love and affection from us 100%. And they are, our dogs are the first to, to defend us with their life if we're in danger. When you give that equal amount of affection, don't go back into your next dog. Or like, so for example, you've got, I've gone Zevia and Johnson and Richard and Robert and the other ones and all that stuff. And I've stopped and, I, and I've done. I will not go back to the same dog or random in between dogs again because I feel guilty or whatever. They're all getting an equal amount of attention and that's it. If I do go back to want to touch them again, Zevia, Johnson, Richard, Robert, back down the line again. It allows our dogs to understand that they have a validity and an acknowledgement from us that they belong in our family. That's building up self-esteem, self-confidence, Self-confidence sometimes, though, depending on the dog, but self-esteem, it gives them the position. Esteem, self-esteem, who we are, what we are, value is on our own end. It gives our dog, it teaches our dog value within our family, within your family, with position and clarity of where the position, position is in the home. Because you've said to them their name in order of how they came in seniority, and that's how it works. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to talk about probably the what to do when your dog is attacked off leash and it's another dog's fault and that part of it when you have a bigger dog smaller dog etc how to deal with those things and um, um, yeah so it's pretty cool I'm under 25 minutes I want to thank everybody for checking in on a Friday I'll uh, actually no I'm probably not going to do one tomorrow I may do it on Sunday as a sneak one but if not it'll be Monday and I'm um, going to keep my, my uh, discussions uh, a bit lower here um, shorter and all that stuff and eventually I'll do the podcast uh, it will go on to YouTube when that happens and if you have anybody who's interested in getting free live video training um, uh, as an exchange for coming on to my podcast uh, please let me know you can email me at james at arf, arf bark, bark .com. or you can get in touch with me through my website arf, arf bark, bark .com. if any of the stuff that I've taught today uh, it resonates with you please subscribe to my youtube channel please follow me on my facebook instagram and twitter under arf arf bark bark you can find me across the board in all those tones of uh, of, of handles i guess and i um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity for you all to share with me uh, the work that i've uh, really have risked my life on um, you know not just bite level six dogs that kill people bite level not none of that true V10 dogs that are predatorial intent to stalk, trap, and kill human beings. And only by working with dogs like that and surviving and not being killed means that I have the experience to do these things. And you will learn that as well as you follow along uh, with my journey. Thank you again, everyone. Have a great night. Be kind to uh, be kind to someone that you have trouble being kind to. Give them an extra 20 seconds of whatever they want to say. Whoever they want to complain about, give them an extra 20 seconds and say, all right, you know what? Um, okay, we talked a little bit longer than usual about this topic. Can we move on? Thank you so much. And if you do that often enough, you will find that the person on the other end won't complain to you as much. Part of this human aspect of manipulation, so to speak, or management, whatever the personality is, it's an aspect of addressing the... Uh, uh, the, the, the desire to be acknowledged for validity of behavior so then when we extend that past the normal threshold that the individual on the other side understands it causes that part it's a the passive training which it is the same as it is in human uh, same as it is in dogs so all these little things right you know 
it, it's part of it. So, you know, you, you've got to integrate the family, you got to integrate the dogs, humans, everything like that. You got to learn how to um, manage everybody. So thank you so much again. Enjoy your Friday. Happy November 1st. And I uh, really appreciate everyone's help in getting